let me start. So I think I, I should start with uh, the part which I didn't, uh, wasn't able to complete last time, which is um, the description of logical framework uh, in, in the um, kind of in the conceptual style which was introduced in, in the previous lecture. So we need to, uh, I want to define LF as a type system, uh, as an example of a type system according to the definition of type systems which was given previously. So let's see what we need to do in order to um, to provide such a definition. So we'll, uh, so definition was a definition of a type system over a monad, over a finitary monad on set. And it was also explained how to assign to any system of expressions with bound, pre and bound variables a monad on set. So the first thing which we need to do, we should uh, answer the question what, or, or, or we should define what is the system of expressions underlying uh, LF. And then we should say what are the four types, four classes, let's say, of sentences of LF. So let's start with the first um, with the first question, and it, it was explained that one can uh, assign to one in order to uh, to define a system of expressions, which is kind of a free, almost free monad uh, on sets. One starts by defining some kind of special symbols, and uh, then forms trees out with labels from this set of special symbols, and then these trees, up to alpha equivalence, which has also been introduced, form a monad on sets. So in order to, to specify uh, such a monad, I just need to say what will be my special symbols. And in, in principle, I can even not say whether which ones of them will be quantifiers and which not. Uh, but uh, just to make things a little uh, more compact, it's good to say which ones are quantifiers and which are not. So um, the special symbols in this case are as follows. So, are as follows. so special symbols or equivalent to labels on trees, on, 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 uh, on vertices uh, of LF. And there are the following ones. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven of them. Uh, so there is type. And I'll write in a square brackets just to, to uh, separate it from, uh, from the rest of the text. There is a product with a subscript little k, and that's a quantifier in one variable. There is a product with a subscript little t, and that's a quantifier in one variable. There is a lambda with subscript, subscript little t, which is a quantifier in one variable. There is eval with subscript little t, which is uh, just a function symbol. And finally, there is a lambda with the subscript little o, which is quantifier in one variable. And then there is evo, which is also a function symbol. So, uh, so uh, LF expressions, according to this definition, are simply labeled trees uh, with these uh, labels uh, up to alpha equivalence, which was defined previously. So we, we know now what is, so we can denote the, um, the set of LF expressions in variables from some kind of set of variables V uh, by this uh, notation. So this will be the set of 
LF expressions up to alpha equivalent with three variables from the set V. Um, so does everybody remember? Maybe I should recall very, very briefly what it means. So uh, the definition of this set proceeds in two steps. One starts by um, taking some kind of an infinite countable set of, uh, I don't remember what the notation for it was, uh, but something which we'll be using for, for names of bound variables. So let's see, let it be DV. So one picks up a set like that. Um, then one defines kind of free expressions or something like that uh, with free variables from V and bound variables from BV uh, as the set of uh, planar rooted planar trees with labeled vertices, including the root, their vertices carry these labels. And uh, in the case when, when the quantifiers are involved, x uh, must be an element of this set. And we'll require, for simplicity of the definition at this point, we'll require uh, some very, very strict rules uh, on um, unbound variables. So, um, so if a variable is, so, so we'll require that all the, um, all the bound variables are different. So we'll require that any quantifier, if it carries the name of a bound variable, then no other quantifier can carry the same name. Whether it's uh, under that quantifier or somewhere totally in another place, the, all the quantifier carry different um, names of bound variables. And then uh, we'll have a permutation uh, group of, on this set acting on our labeled trees. And we'll define the alpha equivalence class is the equivalence class under this action. And that will be uh, our set of LF expressions. Oh, I, I'm talking about usual mathematics. So uh, in, in, in practice, V is, is some sort of an inductive type or, or well, it, it's typically it's something finite in, in most cases, or at most it's something inductive. Uh, like countably inductive, and and this is in in all, this is can, this can always be assumed to be the set of natural numbers. Uh, so this is these are pre-expressions and then expressions are LF expressions is the quotient of this thing. Um, which is up to a canonical isomorphism doesn't depend on the choice of this set. So one can choose the set in whatever way one likes and, and the result will be the same. Uh, now, the, uh, now we have a functor because if I have V1 to V2 a mapping on, on the sets of free variables, then that defines a map from expressions with these free variables to expressions with that free variable. So this, this thing is actually a functor from sets to sets. And moreover, if I have LF x of LF x of V, so let's see what it means. It means that I. Uh, you're correct. Uh, I, I'm sorry. So, uh, so the labels are also, so those are names of free and bound variables and no, excuse me. Uh, I better do it this way. 
So the special symbols of RLF are the following. The labels on, on the expressions are always names of free or bound variables plus special symbols. So that's, that's the, the, the right way to, uh, to formulate it. And now if I have an LF expression with free vari whose free variables are themselves LF expressions. So I'll have this thing and then here I will have where the free variable secure is leaves. I will actually have some LF expressions instead of free variables. And then I can open them up and obtain a new, uh, new big uh, LF expression uh, with free variables uh, in V. So there is this construction. It's very easy to see that it's functorial with respect to, this, uh, to the maps of uh, sets of free variables. So what we obtain is uh, a monad on set. And it has the property that LFX of a direct limit of some sets of free variables is a direct limit of the corresponding sets of LF expressions, just because in every LF expression, only finitely many uh, free variables may occur. Uh, and this property of, of a functor, I call it co-continuous, but I think there is this uh, tendency to call it a finite, finitary monad. So a monad which satisfies this condition. So it's fully determined by its values on finite sets. But it's a little tricky to, to speak about only finite sets because it, the functor goes from finite sets to non-finite sets. So it's easier to speak of it as a final functor on all sets. and um, satisfying this condition. Uh, directed, although in this particular case it probably doesn't matter, but, uh, but the idea is that it's directed, yeah. So, um, so here we have the notion of LF expressions as a monad, on, as a finitary monad on sets. Um, So now we can have a look at, uh, so now we uh, go to the definition of a type system over a system of expressions. And uh, let's recall what it is. So, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a type system over this particular system of expressions should consist of, so we start with, with the set of, let's say, pre-contexts over Free context of length n uh, pre context of length excuse me it's i from zero to n minus one pre context of length i of length n over a given system of expressions and this is given by Here I have to write LF x of zero to i, and this is the set of all possible pre-contexts of lens n over our system of expressions. So then I have a uh, set of all possible uh, typing judgments. Pre, I don't know how to call it. Huh? Thank you. Uh, times Excuse me, x 
probably 1 to n, right? It's 1 to n in, in, in every case. 1 to i. 1 to i. 1 to i. Square. And then I have just eventually I'll learn how to write this without making mistakes every time I do it. Uh, pre-typing, uh, pre-type equality judgment, and finally, pre-object equality judgment. And of course, one can also add some other types of judgments to the same formalism if one wants to. But this seems to be the basic, uh, basic idea of what a type system is. So, uh, so one has this. So elements of this thing are denoted as C1. Or may maybe it will be better to, to sort of call it 1, C1. Uh, n, c, n, and then triangle. Elements of these sets are denoted 1, c, 1, n, c, n. So I'm just using natural numbers as, as names of pre variables. Um, little c and capital C. Elements of this set are denoted 1, c, 1, n, c, n. Uh, C equals C prime, and elements of this set are denoted 1, C1, and Cn. O equals O prime in C. So these are simply notations for elements of this set. Now, type system is specified by uh, fixing subsets in each of those. And the subsets are called Bn of, of a given type system. Uh, so in, in that case, it will be BLFn, subset here, uh, BLFn tilde subset here, n plus 1 control, uh, BLF. EQ N subset here and BLF EQ tilde N plus one subset here. Maybe there is N plus one here as well. Um, hmm? So uh, so these things are just it's just a set of all possible pre contexts of LF. So one uses this, the labels of LF and one uses quotients by alpha equivalents, but one doesn't, doesn't care about whether it makes any sense or not. The only requirement is that Ti only depends on variables up to the number i minus 1, which, which is reflected in this. And now these are the, the derivable contexts. So these are derivable contexts, derivable typing judgments, derivable definitional equalities between type expressions, derivable definitional equalities between object expressions. Hmm? YB? I don't know. It just happens to be so in, uh, um, in, in the paper. And, because we, and, and, we, and now I think it's more or less uh, relatively fixed because we call these things B systems. B systems, so the, those are systems of um, such sets satisfying certain, uh, with certain additional structures on them. Um, now, uh, now, how they are defined in the case of LF? So in the case of LF, as LF is a type system which is defined by uh, an inference rule or derivation rules, whatever one. I don't know, wh which is the best way? Inference rules? OK, inference rules. So it's, it's, um, it's a type system which is um, defined through inference rules. So I'll have to change that also in the paper. Um, so this 
sets are defined, in fact, inductively, or, or one, can, one can use a more uh, kind of mathematical way of doing it, one can say that these sets are this, this collection of subsets is the, collection, it's the smallest collection of subsets which is closed under the operations given by the inference rule. Um, so I have actually written down the inference rules for LF using these labels, like distinguishing application uh, on types with application on, on objects and stuff like this. So they, and, and I think I wrote all of them. They came, it came out to be 27 inference rules, including the structural rules and stuff like this. And I have posted it to the wiki, uh, to the wiki about uh, half an hour, I mean an hour ago. So uh, one can have a look at that. And uh, they're written in exactly the same style as the ones for um, various portions of TS are written. And it should be easy to compare them. Now, uh, as uh, Bob have presented, um, has presented um, LF to us, there were actually uh, more uh, kinds, of more more classes, or more. There was a larger variety of various judgments. I mean, the, there were judgments like the, um, be because kinds were distinguished from types. There was, for example. Uh, a judgment of the form gamma a equals a prime, where a and a, a prime are families of types. Uh, and there was a different kind of judgment where, or a different sort of judgment, where uh, gamma uh, leads to k equals k prime, where k and k prime are kinds. One can do it this way, but since I want things to fit into the definition which was given, I simply don't. Uh, I simply don't distinguish these things. So uh, I don't distinguish uh, on the level of, of this um, definition, I don't distinguish uh, types from kinds. However, in the derivation rules themselves, they are distinguished. So. Um, The point being that, I mean, theoretically, I could also try to bring these two together. But there are type systems where object requires a type to be specified to make sense. However, in uh, these are the same because neither type or family of types nor a kind require any sort of ambient thing to be specified to make sense. I don't know if it's if, if it's clear. I mean, the reason I the reason I cannot put these two together, like in TS, I can bring these two things together. It means that instead of considering, it would be a little ugly, but instead of considering four types of uh, sentences, I could consider three types of sentences by mixing the object equalities and the type equalities into one type of one kind of sentence. I'm not sure what you are saying. I know that this approach works. I don't know about. Well, collection of all types is a type in my sense, in the sense that uh, it, it, it's called, it, it's a kind, right? Mm -hmm. And kinds and types are, are not distinguished on, on this, in, in this part of, uh, of the description. So it's probably the same.
Well, there is this thing. There is there, there is a label called type. Yes, I mean, it, uh, what is, well, it's, it's actually this, this, these things are not called exactly types. They're called families of types, and for a good reason in a lab. Because uh, families of types have something like a type, but this something like a type is a kind which is different from, some, from simply type. Um, well, may, maybe I should say something slightly more uh, more precise. Excuse me. Uh, oops. <coughs> Pardon. <laughs> L let me say something more precise. So let, let me let me go back to um, to the way Bob presented LF. And uh, Bob presented LF as follows. So there is um, th there are following types of of judge following sorts of judgments. Um, K is a kind, right? I, I, if you, you'll correct me if I'm uh, T in K, uh, little t in capital T, and then there is gamma K equals K prime, gamma T equals T prime, and then there is gamma little t equals little t prime in a capital T. Uh, now one could, so there are actually six of them in the standard presentation. What I'm doing is I'm uh, bringing these two together and these two together. So uh, this, let me write it. So this goes to LFB. This goes to LFB, uh, BLF, excuse me. This goes to BLF. This goes to BLF tilde. This goes to BLF EQ. And this goes to BLF EQ tilde. Now, there is one place where one has to be somewhat careful. Uh, it doesn't affect. Hmm? Yes, but I, the point is that one doesn't really have to write this thing. Uh, the, the better way of doing it is not to write it. Because the, the kind of a, of a type expression can be uh, reconstructed by the type expression. Yeah, let's actually, actually, that's probably right. I mean, um, um, you see, I may have to. Okay, let's. Um, Yes, and then you, you have to do the same thing on the right, but uh, and then one has to write here k. Yeah, but but if you look at the derivation rules, so there is the following derivation rule: gamma a a x k. Gamma B, B K X B 
Um, that's a derivation rule for uh, forming a product. And it is important here that this is actually a type and not a kind. So, uh, so, this, uh, so in order to actually formulate everything carefully, one, goes, uh, one introduces an extra step. Uh, and an extra step is there is a definition of LF terms. And LF terms are defined as, or actually maybe I, maybe I should even, even do something easier. There is a definition of uh, three kinds of LF expressions. LF expression is a K expression or T expression or O expression. So just as, as TS is a colored type theory, and so is LF. LF is also a colored type theory. So it's a type theory where expressions are syntactically subdivided into, uh, in, into uh, well-defined separate classes. Like the type system of Koch, for example, is not a, um, a colored type theory because there is a, a complete mess up between, um, I, I know it's convenient, but th there is the, the objects and types are, are not distinguishable from each other on, on a purely syntactic basis. Uh, so I both in LF and in TS, they are distinguishable in a purely syntactic basis. Please. Um, and so K expressions are the ones which start with type or phi Kx. Uh, T expressions are the ones which start with, oh, let's, let's have a look here, with phi Tx or lambda Tx or EVT, so these subscripts are chosen just to exactly fit this uh, classification. And OR expressions are the ones which start with lambda OX uh, or EVO. So there is this simple syntactic classification of, uh, of expressions. And this rule, when it's formulated, it says if A is a um, T expression and K is a K expression, then one can apply this rule. And this conditioning on the rule prevents one to, from having things like functions from type to type which are forbidden in, in LF. So the way to, to take care of it is just to introduce this condition on the derivation rule. And in this uh, little um, note, which I have posted, I, I hope most conditions are written up carefully. If, if there is, I, I would very much appreciate if someone had a look at it and, and maybe there are some things which are uh, missing. But so, okay, so by doing this grouping, and I, I think you're right that the grouping has to be done in this way. Uh, and so, uh, so we're dealing with um, pla placing all the sentences of um, LF into uh, four sorts as opposed to, to six sorts by simply um, doing that. Um, one fits LF into the framework of, of the definitions of this lecture. So uh, LF becomes a type system in the sense of um, my definition. And I would like also to add some note, which I, I'll probably add it to the paper at some point. But uh, so there is also a concept of a colored. And colored comes from topology. There is a notion of a colored operad. And that's where it comes from. So it means that, like, you're like when when if one visualizes sets as, as kind of collections of balls, then uh, then one visualizes colored sets as collections of balls with, with different colors. Uh, and uh, in uh, mathematically speaking, what is a colored set? It, it's a set over another set. So there, there's a category of sets, and then there's a category of sets over a given set. 
So if, if I consider not just sets X, but sets over some fixed set B, what is a set over a fixed set B? It means that every element of X is assigned an element of B. So if B is a set of my colors, that's the same as coloring uh, the elements of X in several various colors. And so that's, that's where the term comes from. And um, so the results of a colored monad, which would Here? Definition upper board. Definition upper board. Oh, um, the following labels are permitted in expressions of LA. Names of T constants, names of O constants, names of O variables, type, and blah, blah, blah. So, so that. Uh, yeah, it's, it just so happens that it's terminological issue that T variables in, uh, in LF are called constants. That's, that, that's, that's a pure, uh, because they're not allowed to be declared because there's a dis distinction between signatures and, con and, and context. Oh, I, and I'm sorry for, for, for it being a little messy, but uh, hopefully it's still understandable. There is one thing about type systems which, uh, which needs to be, which is relevant here. So if T is a type, or well, T is a type system, And gamma is a context uh, in T. Then one can form a new type system T over gamma. And that actually fits with the definition of a type system which is given here. So one can formally define for every context gamma there is a definition of a type system T over gamma. Uh, and so uh, the, this, this talk about signature defining a type system, what is actually meant, signature is a context in this ambient uh, LF. And when one speaks about kind of smaller, small LF over a given uh, context of a big LF, that's the same as talking about a uh, type system uh, of LF over a signature. And I think it all, it's all formalized, I mean, it all, all the formalization in these terms goes, goes quite well and without any, uh, any glitches, as far as I can, as, as far as I could verify. So, yes. Yes, I mean, your, 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 your analytical, uh, or, or not analytical, your, yeah, analytical, right, analytic analytic interpretation has a lot to do with this, except for some difference. Um, so, uh, so anyway, there is also a colored monad, which is uh, a monad on sets over a given set uh, B, where B is a base, base set or set of colors. So one can repeat everything which was said here uh, in terms of colored monads. There is totally no difference. And uh, that precisely corresponds to uh, considering type systems which have syntactic distinction uh, between different sorts of expressions. So TS, for example, is, a, is actually a colored type system with three colors. And uh, well, TS is a little is a little tricky, but uh, but I think it because the U-level expressions are a little bit outside of. Yeah, I, I, I'll have to think about it. Yeah, probably. 
So, but LF is definitely a colored uh, type system with three colors, uh, K, C, and O. And, um, and one can also formulate it as a colored type system, or one can forget about colors and formulate it as, as, as a, um, how to say it, uh, as a plain type system. Um, this, these two approaches are, mathematically speaking, don't differ much, but uh, formulating things as colored type systems is probably more kind of underlies better the, uh, the structure of the system. So that was my uh, presentation of LF as a type system. I also want to mention, because I don't think everybody understands it, but like for every system of expressions, there is a type system in my sense in which all contexts, all pre-contexts are, are well-formed and all judgments are well-formed. So there is this ambient type system associated with a system of expressions, which, which is totally meaningless semantically because it's like you can write absolutely everything and it will be correct. But mathematically, it turns out to be the most convenient way of defining things is by first defining this totally meaningless thing and then defining everything else as, as sub-objects of this, uh, of this meaningless thing. So the general type systems definitely have no, no sense in, in them. <laughs> um, so that was, uh, that was this part. I think I'm using it in two different senses. Uh, the, the first meaning is just a finitary monad on set. The second meaning is a particular class of finitary, uh, finitary monad on sets which belongs to a particular class of finitary monads, namely ones which are um, obtained from, uh, namely ones uh, whose are elements or something like that are alpha equivalence classes of, of such expression trees. One can, con one can also consider like expressions of, of I don't know, of, of arithmetic, for example, which also fit into this, um, into this framework and which also provide a monad. Um, yeah, I think I don't need that. So that was an example of how one starts with a syntax and, and creates uh, a B system, in this case, the B system of LF. And, um, So now I'm returning to, to the theme which we have started uh, during the last lecture, and that was the B systems are, which come from uh, categories with universes. And so the main, uh, the main idea of this approach is to kind of connect syntax and semantics of type systems by going this way. So one starts with a, syn a syntactic, syntactic object and associates to it a B system. Then one starts with uh, a category with a structure, well, with a universe, 
and associates to, to it a B system. And then one defines interpretation of the syntactic object in a category as a homomorphism of B systems of associated B systems. And so that's in the main idea of, of this framework. So um, we have discussed yesterday the issue of the category with the universe. Uh, not yesterday, the last time. Uh, and um, s let me recall it a little bit. So definition, uh, a universe in a category C is, first it's a morphism, a morphism P from U tilde to U. And second, for each x an object of C, a choice uh, of fullback square uh, for each x and and the function and the morphism f from x to u, a choice of a fullback square built on f. So. Um, f upper star uh, x. No, what was the notation? Uh, x f x So we have to choose an object and the morphism such that and the morphism here, three things in fact, such that together it forms a fullback square. And this is called a universe in a category. So basically this is called the universe and this is kind of an auxiliary structure which um, now I want to um, okay I'll, I'll make this comment a little later so um, and we have uh, I have outlined a construction which given any category with a universe builds a B structure and builds it in such a way that when a category with a universe is uh, replaced by an equivalent category with a universe, uh, the B structures change by B structure changed by, the, uh, by by an isomorphic one. So this provides some kind of a mapping from H level three to H level two. And so this is how it works. One starts with a category with a universe, generates a B system, starts with a syntactic description of a type system, uh, type theory generates a B system, and then defines uh, interpretation as a homomorphism from one B system to another. Now, uh, so what I was, what I'm going to start discussing today is the following. So, suppose this type system has dependent products. So how can one write what it means for a type system to have dependent products on the language of B systems? Then how can one write, how can one start with this, this notion in B systems and rewrite it in terms of the universe in a category? And so there will be a notion of a dependent product structure in a universe which is parallel to the notion of a dependent structure, uh, dependent product structure on, uh, in a type system. Then, I mean, presumably, presumably the idea of the derivation uh, description of type systems can be, uh, probably should be ultimately represented as follows. That there are certain, certain constructs, syntactic constructs and, and inference rules and, and uh, reduction rules uh, for a type system, they actually correspond some additional to some additional structures on the associated B system. And moreover, the fact that type system is built 
from kind of objects which can be parsed in a sense, so whose, whose derivations can be reconstructed, it should be equivalent to saying that the corresponding B system is a free B system with the given additional structures. So the type systems are actually the meaningful type systems, not general type systems, but meaningful type systems are syntactic representations of free B systems with additional structure. Now that's extremely convenient for the uh, semantics because if I have a free B system with some additional structures and I want to construct a homomorphism from it, that's equivalent to constructing the same to structures on, on the target B system. So then interpretation of a type system becomes equivalent to uh, interpreting a type system becomes equivalent to building certain uh, additional structures on the B system associated with a universe in a category. And for that we'll have theorems which say that a certain, a certain additional structure on this morphism generates a certain additional structure on a B system which corresponds to known structures on, on type systems. So ultimately, what we want to have is to say, okay, so uh, when can I uh, model a type system in a given uh, category with the universe? Basically, if and only if, or, or at least if, maybe only if I don't need here, but uh, in order to construct a model, it's sufficient, not necessarily, not necessary maybe, but sufficient to simply build some uh, structures on such on this morphism. And that's how the uh, simplicial model is constructed, in fact, uh, of a univalent model. So, and an excellent example of how this works is the example of dependent products as a structure. And so we'll, uh, we'll consider it in some detail. Um, So today I will um, only do some little things about it. Mm. So I need a definition of, so I'm fixing let T be a category. Oh, uh, let me say, it probably doesn't make that much sense to, to start a uh, new topic today, but I want to make a comment which will be useful for this topic. Um, suppose I have a category. Now I can do, I can say two different things. One thing I can say is that C has fiber products, for example. So there exist fiber products in C. And another thing which I can say, uh, let's choose fiber products in C. So uh, set theoretically, these two things are different. In one case, I'm saying that something exists, but there said theoretically there are many, 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 many fiber products. So let's even, or one can think about direct products if one wants. Said theoretically there are enormous number of, of different uh, choices. So uh, said theoretically these two things are not, not the same, they're not equal. Uh, in the univalent found, in the univalent, uh, situation, uh, something interesting happens. So um, I may consider the type of all possible choices of fiber products on C. And I may ask what, what, what is this type? Like what H level it has? And um, as far as I understand, there is the following theorem, which uh, somebody maybe may, may want to prove. So I'll, I'll use both uh, both your terminology and my terminology. So I'll, I'll first say it in my terminology. 
if C is a saturated category and then the type of choices of fiber products on C uh, is an H probe, is in H probe. So the, the type of all possible choices of fiber products is an H probe, so is, is a proposition. So in particular, if it has uh, a representative, if it has an object, if there is at least one object in it, then it's a unit type. And so there is absolutely no difference. So these things are actually equal modulo the univalence axiom in the type theory, provided C is saturated. Yes, I, I'm going to say it. Uh, uh, so, uh, so there is a slight difference in terminology, which you're probably familiar with, with the other terminology. So uh, what I call a category, uh, Michael prefers to call a pre-category, and then what I call a saturated category is a category. Uh, and this is a terminological uh, issue, but um, so a pre-category is, is anything which has uh, a type of object uh, for any x and y, uh, for any x, y, a type of morphisms, for any x, y, z, uh, composition, and so on. So, uh, so this, is, this thing is called a pre-category. Yes, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so this morphisms in, in H set, right. So th th then it's called a pre-category, or I call it a category. Um, and then a category, which I call saturated category, is the same thing with one additional condition that if uh, that the natural map, the function from the identity type between two objects to the type of isomorphisms between two objects is an isomorphism, right? Or equivalence, or equivalence, but that kind of doesn't really matter because both sides are sets. Uh, yes, yes, okay, an equivalence. So, uh, no, weak equivalence, in fact, weak equivalence. That, that, yeah, yeah, weak equivalence. No, but. These are usually sets. They're definitely not categories. Um, well, this is definitely a set, but, but this is not necessarily a set because we, we haven't uh, required this C to be of, uh, of type 3, of, of level 3. So what happens, so, so if it is saturated, so if this is an equivalence, then the choice or, or existence are the same thing. In general, it's not true because, for example, I can take any set level category which I've been considering, any of the set level categories which I have been considering, they're all not saturated. For all of them, the, for all of them, the uh, objects are actually sets. Equalities of elements in the set uh, have very little to do with isomorphisms. So there are many fewer equalities than isomorphisms in all of the set level categories. So the, all of them, as categories don't satisfy this condition. And so for them, the theorem doesn't hold. So if I want to operate with this kind of unsaturated categories or pre-categories, then, then there is a difference between a choice of fiber products and uh, an assertion that fiber products exist. So in this construction,
You mean satur instead of saturated, say skeletal? If, if, if I understand you correctly, it means that any two isomorphic objects are equal. Mm -hmm. That's not exactly the same as we discussed last time, because if you want a set level category to be saturated, for a set level category to be saturated, it's necessary and sufficient that uh, all isomorphisms in that category are identities. Mm -hmm. So I mean, so for set level it almost never happens. It means that there are no automorphisms without automorphism. I was just we're going to uh, usually saturate it. So the categories which occur on that side of, of, of the picture are usually saturated categories. There are some kind of categories of simplicial sets or sets or, or something like that which, um, which are saturated. Modulo unival in fact. So. Is that, yes, I mean, this, this are. And, and the categories which arise from B systems are, are kind of never saturated. So there is a, the real. A real um, This? Yeah. Uh, that's a category in the sense of mathematics. Mm -hmm. But if we, when we write it, when we will rewrite all of that in, in type theory, which we're going to do, and we're actually doing <laughs> in, uh, as of now, I mean, I mean for, for it, is, it is being done right now. <laughs> so um, then it will be a category in type theoretics. Well, it does, because in mathematical sense, there's nothing else but sets. In, in a classical mathematical sense. Yes, but this is the issue of size, which, which is irrelevant to the issue of H levels. This is orthogonal issue, kind of. Classes are just sets which are very big. There's nothing much. <laughs> The notion of saturated uh, makes very little sense in set theory. I mean, it reduces to what we were just discussed, uh, discussing to the notion of a category which is skeletal and has no isomorphisms. So that's a very kind of uh, very restrictive uh, condition. So let's say that saturated makes little sense in set theory. I'm saying that when we formalize all of this in type theory, then these categories are typically saturated categories. Well, it's because it's something like a category of sets or a category of simplicial sets, and they're all saturated. Well, I said that the categories which arise from syntactic B systems, the set level categories which arise from syntactic B systems, are typically not saturated. 
So the ones which live on this level, this is a homomorphism. So, so there can be lots of homomorphism of functors from something which is not saturated to something which is saturated. So it's kind of here things are unsaturated in a sense, and here things are saturated. In, in, or, or, No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. Uh, no reason to. That's right. Right, that's a good way of putting it. Where, when, we de when we define them in, in, in the univalent type theory, I, I, when we define them in the type theory or univalent type theory, they, th they are saturated. No, but this, this really, I mean, you see we're confused even now. If, if we just call it category, we'll be confused even more. Well, but you're confused now. I, if we start calling this just a category, you'll be totally confused and you wouldn't even notice that you're confused, which is much worse than being confused. <laughs> No, but it's not always there in type theory. It's not always there in type theory. Not by far always there in type theory. No, but I'm using here all the time set level categories which are not saturated. Yes. Well, I can also argue from my saturated from an intuitive perspective. And the, the argument for saturated is that the underlying, so every category has an underlying type. And it's saturated in a sense that if a category is, does not satisfy this property, then you can extend the set of, uh, identities in the underlying type so that it will start to satisfy this property. So you can add more identities in the underlying type to any category such that it, or to any pre-category such that it becomes a category. And that for me, and, but, you, but you cannot, cannot add more. Th there is just that many identities which you can add to a, uh, to a category without kind of destroying its, uh, its equivalence class. And so in every equivalence class, there is precisely one saturated representative up to uh, up to equivalence uh, model univalence but but this will imply this will imply that they are at most h level 3 yeah, but what I mean is if you start with three categories and some objects in the bubble yes But you still get something which will be equivalent to the original one if you define the equivalent. Yes, but if you define the equivalence just up to the first level of coherences, then I suspect. That may be right. Uh, 
that may be right. So, but but let's let's suppose we have H level three there for for now. Yeah, you need something like an axiom of choice for that, presumably. No, if you add axiom of choice, then it's uh, then it's true because if you have a surjection from 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 a from a set to a type. Yeah. Okay. 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 But the notion of equivalence has to be. Uh, um, Defined in a careful way. Equivalence between categories have to be uh, uh, carefully considered. Uh, equivalence between two saturated categories, I suppose, is is a good notion. If, if you have univalence, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so that's. I think that's that's it for today. Sorry for for uh, for keeping you longer than. Thank you.